After a decade of shaking my head in both horror and bewilderment, I finally found a use for Avatar. James Cameron, bless him, aged into someone interesting after I'd written him off as a moony rube high on the idea of flying with dragons and shit. Turns out he wasn't pining for an end to his reality, he was pining for an end to the body and the gender assigned to it. Remember, if you will, this scene, where the heroes meet in a kind of fluid nether space to have sex? That was the linchpin, it turns out, and I missed it because I was too busy laughing. I mean, come on, it's ridiculous, but... Anyway. Cameron has since only produced documentaries on climate change, veterans affairs, protein, and other Avatar-related content. And he's done two other things. He's helped fund the creation of artificial limbs for amputees, and he wrote and produced two fiction films. Alita Battle Angel became a trans film cause celeb because, like a select few other sci-fi titles, it successfully captures the sensation of body dysphoria. Here's critic Esther Rosenfield. When Alita wakes up in Ito's clinic, she has no memory of her former life. Aside from the ability to speak, she has no memory of anything at all. She's as much a blank slate as a person can be, taking in every tiny experience for the first time. She has no real understanding of herself or the world around her. And yet she knows that her body is wrong. This is perhaps the only thing she knows. She knows it because she doesn't have to know it. She feels it somewhere deep within herself, some part she can't access, but only feel its reverberations thrumming arrhythmically through her mind. Something is wrong with my body. My body is not my body. Alita's narrative throughline concerns the acquaintanceship between a mind and a body, searching in essence for the harmony that only exists in Avatar when the souls leave their bodies and find themselves in the formless, sensual purgatorial now. Cameron's next film is writer-producer, Terminator, Dark Fate. I liked this one, but not enough to make it one of the unloved. Director Tim Miller is clearly just no good. His CGI action sequences are quite poor, everything looking rubbery and ten years out of date. It's the conceptual stuff that's good. The things Cameron might conceivably have had a hand in creating. Thanks to everything concerning Mackenzie Davis's technologically enhanced super soldier, we have the third in Cameron's Dysmorphia trilogy. She's not quite machine and not quite human, and the conflict tears her up. You can see it on her face. She's been sent to do one job, keep a machine from achieving its goal, which means that she's got the same single-mindedness, and it eats at her that she's only got one purpose, and she's ill-equipped to carry it out, despite having been reborn for no other purpose. I'm crashing. You're running up. My metabolism was tuned for short, intense bursts. You either stop a Terminator in the first few minutes, or you're dead. <laughs> Hey! Grace! Wake up! Watching Davis, styled to look like an anime heroine, muscular and fearsome, a very careful curation of a righteous, queer, feminine aesthetic do her best by this hopelessly banal action movie, acres of prose replayed itself in my head. I think about my friend, the critic Willow McClay's writing, on the trans canon in sci-fi. She's not a child, but a fully grown individual in the sense that she did not have a childhood. She came into this world as an adult and had to live her life as a young woman. In the scope of transgender ideology, there is often a feeling of death and rebirth when coming out. For many individuals, myself included, childhood that doesn't go as planned, and when you're finally ready to be yourself and be a woman, you walk into a world that you have to relearn. You're born as an adult, without enough of the basic knowledge that comes with being given a cisgender girlhood. A recent scientific study theorized that gender dysphoria sends signals to the brain that tell the body it is injured. That means you are living as a wounded creature, except the wounds can't be patched up. You just have to get used to carrying them. Grace! Señorita, ¿necesita ayuda? No. Estamos bien, gracias. Por favor! 
What are you laughing? I need any anticonvulsant. Sodium, polystyrene, sulfonate, insulin, benzodiazepine. Perdón. Do you have a doctor's prescription? Here's my prescription. Writer and friend, Sam Morrow. The first time I ever felt present in my body was with people watching from other rooms. This is messy, of course. I know I should have explored my body healthily on my own and with loved ones I trusted before I ever broadcast myself on that scale. That is not how it worked out for me. The acceptance and awareness of my body, I needed to finally identify my swollen skin as the woman it was tugging to be. Writer Aaron Penny. Masculinity does not only belong to cis men, it's for anyone and everyone who identifies with it. Calling me a tomboy implies that my interpretation of masculinity is somehow less valid and authentic than when a cis man performs masculinity. Even though I am a feminine person, my masculinity belongs to me and me only, and I reject any labels attempting to oppress that. No amount of screaming the words, I'm perfect exactly as I am, is going to change the fact that I'm masculine and that my body doesn't match that feeling. May I ask what you are? No. Writer Sebastian Zolsch, there has been a constant expectation throughout my life to grow into traditional femininity. I've had friends tell me to dress like a woman because they think it will give me more confidence. I've had a few people pin me down to try and put makeup on me because I have to, quote, wear it eventually. Hell, it's even built into our cultural narrative. The ugly, sarcastic duckling gets a makeover, and she's suddenly a confident, sexy woman. There's absolutely nothing wrong with traditional femininity, but it's not the only way to be a woman. And sometimes it's hard to even find acceptance for my choice of expression in feminist circles. I don't like makeup. I must think I'm a special snowflake. I don't consider myself feminine. I must think I'm better than women who do. And that's not the case. I don't think I'm better than anyone. In fact, I'm worse than most people, but that's besides the point. I don't care what you enjoy or how you present yourself. My mode of gender expression is not a judgment of you. I'm just living as best as I know how. Did I say you could look at my private parts? Where do they take the new prisoners? They're called detainees, and we... They're taken to the south end holding area for profit. Thanks. Davis's performance. The unblinking stare, the fearlessness, and the way she presents her body for scrutiny. It draws the eyes and the mind, left abandoned by the action in the film. Davis has long been the face of a kind of probing and succinct queer immediacy. The search for a double. A mirror in the cinema, not ready to give a reflection to so many people. She's the woman between. A tractor of codes, portrayer of doppelgangers. She's a new kind of 21st century star. The movie fails her, but it also gives her a space to continue to write a thesis with her body that she's been crafting for many years now. She's the latest personification of Cameron's machinist's dysphoria. Believing there's something else in your skin and fighting your programming. Cameron's played with deceptive surfaces before. He's given in to and revolted against norms and standards. He's created many of the most significant images of women skirting traditionally feminine appearance and behavior, opening up femininity in the cinema to include muscular, armed women, denying that femininity or masculinity are defined by a binary or by previous depictions of either. I also love the way that Linda Hamilton, who used to be the woman Cameron used to write this thesis, now has to adapt to learn that her struggles may have only shaped her, and after years of destroying herself, she may have a chance to love herself again, that it's okay for other women to express themselves their own way. There is no fate but what we make for ourselves. Danny, you are not the mother of some man who saves the future. You are the future. That's why Legion wants you dead. She's John. You're John. I'm 
Sorry, I didn't tell you this before. I love all of the different kinds of femininity on display in this movie. They're also richly realized thanks to the performances. From aging, traumatized, and gorgeous Linda Hamilton to grief-stricken, stunned, but defiant Natalia Reyes, a Latina in her 30s, as the unwilling and unwitting key to the world's survival. I thought that. couldn't find him if they didn't know what he looked like but now I'm forgetting his face I'm sorry I've given Cameron a ton of shit over the years but he's proven me wrong about the flippancy of his work in the last two decades he was still building something important one last addition to his free gendered utopia Obviously he sees, because his films are about struggle and violence, how much further we all have to go. But he never lost sight of a universal, personal freedom. And believed that the truth, for many of us, lie between the staunch roles crafted by the first century of cinematic images. Women in Cameron's world have fought hardest for the future. And he's never stopped trying to give young women the non-traditional heroes they deserve. Women they can look up to when they're young and remember fondly when they've grown, all the while changing and adapting into who they are. The future is still at risk, but with heroes that reflect us, we might have a better chance at changing it for the better.